Good morning to each one of you. Happy to greet you in the name of Jesus. Glad to see each one of you that has chosen to come and worship this morning. Appreciated that song. I believe everybody needs a friend. And um, as we think about the life of Solomon, and one of the key things I see there, especially in the lesson that we studied this morning, is he uh, realized how much he needed God and how much he needed something he didn't have. And that's a good place for us to stay at. You can turn with me to the book of James. I would like to continue studying in James. Started this a few weeks ago, so if this is news to you, I understand. You may have forgot, but I would like to learn more about what James has for us. So you can turn with me to James 1. This morning we want to look at verses 18 to 27, so right in the middle of the chapter. But if you remember, uh, I believe it was probably about eight weeks ago, I preached a message on being faithful in tribulation. And that we are going to have life that happens to us. In this passage, part of that that was happening was persecution. But there's also trials that come our way that are happening to you this morning. And that we must be patient in them. And we must let them have their perfect work. So that we can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then also, James reminds us that we as human beings get into tight situations and we start wondering if God is the one to blame for the reason we're in the situation and we can want to blame God for sending temptation our way. And James says, let us know that man is tempted when we are drawn away from our own lust and enticed. And verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. And unlike the stars and the sun and where there's shadows and things are changing, God has no changing. So before we get into the message, just a little bit about James. James is a very uh, to-the-point kind of guy. He is a be-real type of individual. And what do we know about James as far as who is he? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but who can remind us of who James, who is James? What family does he fit into? Lord's brother. That is correct. He'd be obviously a half-brother, and as I would understand it, I believe he was most likely second to the oldest in the family, right underneath Jesus. So that means that in, when James grew up, his older brother would have been Jesus. He would have experienced what none of us have experienced, and that is to truly be able to say that I have a brother who's perfect. Mom and dad barely think it, and he does it. And he was a perfect, a perfect child. That could be hard <laughs> to, um, to honestly have a brother who always got it right. But that's what he grew up in. And what, what, el we, what we also know is that James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. As Jesus was, was beginning his ministry, James did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. And that continued on even to crucifixion. But it was sometime after crucifixion, I would believe that they had an encounter, but James became a believer. And he went from unbelief to a man that speaks to us about faith. And James was a pillar in the church. He was a leader. And you see, what was the title of the Sunday School lesson this morning? Um, defining moments. I would say that for us, James had a defining moment there in Acts 15, where the church was having a bit of a disagreement of what does church life look like in regards to circumcision. 
and there was a lot of varying opinion. And James moderated that and helped move the, f the church forward in a, in a unifying manner. So the theme of this book, you could say, is be real. We are beautiful looking Mennonites, or you are this morning. Um, you look like your life is put together. Um, and you are, you are here dressed in your best to, to worship God as, as it should be because of who we serve. But, but let's, let's be real. Let's be real about things that happen in our life. James is a be real. And if there's going to be a theme, it is faith is belief in God demonstrated in action. It's, it's, it's real, okay? It's not something we just talk about. When life happens, it shows itself, and it's the true thing. It's the real deal. Title of the message this morning is Do Not Kid Yourself. A bit of an unorthodox title. Hopefully you can accept that title, Do Not Kid Yourself. And it comes out of uh, verses 22 and 23. I'd like to tell you of a story of a man by the name of Andros Stamos. He was a Hungarian, and he was looking to be a part of overthrowing the Soviets. And so he joined a revolution to, to conquer the Soviet Union. And in 1945, at the age of 20, he was captured by the Soviets and incarcer incarcerated. And after 55 years of imprisonment, he was believed to have gone insane and therefore was transferred to a psych uh, psychiatric ward in solitary confinement 300 miles outside of Moscow. And, f and uh, 55 years later, in the year 2000, the Russians were trying to empty out their prison, uh, pr particularly from um, folks in there from, uh, from war. And so they brought a Hungarian psychiatrist to examine this man. Like, was this man really insane? And the psychiatrist ex examined Samos and, and for, uh, for a few hours and concluded that this man is not insane. In fact, um, it's you who are driving him insane. And he's not talking nonsense. Rather, he is speaking a rare dialect of Hungarian. And so they released him. And he had, if you know the story, a very unique request. After being in prison for 55 years, he's now 75 years old, and he had a very unique request. And his question was, can I see a mirror? May I have a mirror? Can I have a mirror? Was his request. And at 75 years old, he looked at that mirror for just briefly. And after seeing himself in the mirror, he put his face in his hands and sobbed uncontrollably like a little baby because of what he was seeing, of what had happened to him. He went from a man who was 20 years old and he was a fighter. He was going to make things happen and set people straight to a, to a man who, who was he? What did he become? Is there a mirror this morning for our souls? What should my life as a follower of Jesus Christ look like? And I believe that James this morning is, is in, in verses 18 to 27, one of the things he wants to make clear is that, that we are not deceived, that we do not look in the mirror and forget what we see and go away unchanged. And so let's not kid ourselves. And, and we know what it's like when, when folks kid themselves. Some of you, a lot of you have children and you see their, their talented ability to, to forget things that they need to forget so that they don't have the right answer for you. And it's like, who are you kidding? You, you know what just happened. And, and, and maybe you're not tuned into politics, which is great, but maybe you are. And you're like, this whole go green thing and how toxic some of the electrification is. And you're like, who are you kidding? You're not kidding me. 
And, and, and we as Christians, we have been exposed to God's word for many, many years. And if God's word has not changed us, then who are we kidding? Let's read verses 18. I'm going to take the... I'm going to take the... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just read 18 to 27 rather than... No, I should read the whole passage. Let's read the whole passage. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting... My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall, he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways." Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no vari variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man, if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, be dece but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, and widows in their infliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Can we stand for a brief word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can call upon your name in faith, nothing wavering, and that we can receive. Father, we need your Holy Spirit here among us. I pray, Lord, that I could be an instrument in your hands. Father, just speak what you would have each one of us to hear. And I pray for clarity. Give us understanding and give us a desire to take your word and to do it. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning... We want to look at several aspects of how we receive God's Word. And then we are going to look at the application, what happens when we do receive God's Word. But before we do that, I do not want to cruise through verse 18. Verse 18, I believe, is crucial. It's crucial. Because 
it's, it's foundational. It, it is God's will for mankind. Of his own will he begat he us with the word of truth. I, I feel sometimes like I can, can read what Christ has done for me. And, and we know that the reason that we love him is because he first loved us. But sometimes that, that just doesn't grip me like it should. But do we understand that it was, is God's will that all should experience salvation and all that should experience eternal life? And it was Him that made a plan so that we could be in His family. You know, recently I, I thought of this illustration and it's helpful for me when, when, and when I just need to consider that it was Christ who died for me and chose me. Um, when the Titanic sunk back in, what year was that? 1940? No. I forget. It doesn't matter. It had over 2,000, yeah, not 40. It had over 2,000 souls on board and lifeboats that was in the thousands. Whenever you tell us illustration, you should do your homework first. I did not do that. But anyways, the point of this little illustration is that if I was on that Titanic that night and the ship is beginning to sink, whether that is deck up or, or whatever was happening, and it's, it's pretty clear that's, that there are going to be people that die. And if I was on that ship and there is someone that is manning the lifeboats and it is him that makes the decision of who gets in the lifeboat and doesn't. And, and he's, you know, maybe scanning the crowd for who's going to come next. And for him to choose you to be able to get in that lifeboat and experience life when you know otherwise you would perish. That, that helps me understand a little bit the opportunity that Christ is giving us. Okay? And so it is his desire that we are a kind of first fruits. And today you put money in the offering and that is, that is a, a tithe that you give, that you, you understand that you are a steward of the things that God has given you and that some of that needs to go specifically to God's work. And so you give a tithe and in the Old Testament they were supposed to give a first fruit which often would be like animals for sacrifice. And so they would bring um, the best that they had as a first fruit, as an offering. They didn't bring their calls and, and the stuff that didn't make the cut, but they bring the best. And, and in a sense, that is what Christ is wanting us to be. We are um, consecrated for Him, and we are His first fruits. And in verse 19, wherefore, or because of that, here are some things that we need to be doing. How do we have, how does, what does our life look like as a follower of Jesus Christ, as someone who has real faith? Number one, we must receive God's word. This comes out of verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, um, well, it's all through this passage. Also in verse 21, we are to receive with meekness the engrafted word. But I want to just kind of back up and look at how do we receive God's word. One of the things that I'm finding more and more clearly as I maybe have more understanding of God and his scripture is that yes, Jesus' blood washes us and cleanses us. It's Jesus' blood that cleanses us and, and it is only through him that we are saved. But there, it's interesting, all of the references that are given in the scripture, how the word is, is part of what does the washing. The, the word washes us and it's, it's part of the sanctification process. And, and so if we are going to be able to look in the mirror one day 
and not be a broken down man wondering where have we come in our, how we got here in our spiritual life, we are going to have to receive God's word because it, it is what is going to continue to wash us. Um, Paul says in 1 Thess Thessalonians 2 verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. And that's like an active word. It's working in them that believe. And that is what should still be happening to us today. As God's word is coming to us, it worketh in us. God is not going to, well, backing up. So some of the things, sometimes we hear that we have a new generation or, or we are on the cusp of a new age. What worked in the past does not work in the future, and this is a, a new generation. And this applies to like various aspects of life. Definitely heard it in church life. I hear it in the work environment, okay? And it's interesting to consider, and it is true. There is a generation today, including myself and some of you that are here, that what you're looking for in life is different than what your mom and dad were. So there's some, some truth in that. But God is not going to rewrite the Bible for your generation, for my gen generation. And we need to stop trying to change scripture when it is written to change you, when it is written to change me. And the reason I say that is because we must understand, I must understand, that my heart is sinful. My heart is not pretty. I can look all religious and all pious up here, and I do my best to serve the Lord, but Romans 3 tells us that there is none that are righteous, there is none that uh, are profitable, uh, their mouths are full of deceit, bitterness, destruction is in their path, there is no peace in their life. That is what man is. That's what I am. That's what you are, without our heart being changed. May I say that? And so, if we realize that our heart is deceitful, Matthew 13 talks about this. He says, the word of God goes out, and some of it lands on stony ground, some of it lands on thorny ground, and some of it lands on good ground. The seed is all the same. But the heart that takes it, that receives it, it springs forth, and it brings forth fruit. Okay, so how can we receive God's word? With submission. This is a word that, I don't know, is it just me? The word submission, I have to lower the walls that want to pop back up because submission, you know, I have to submit. Like it's Steve has to submit. But if we're going to receive God's word, we've got to receive it in submission. What does that look like? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. I submit to you this morning that one of the ways that we receive God's word is by hearing. Hebrews 3 verse 15 says, as it is today, or as it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Hebrews 5.11 says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, and seeing ye are dull of hearing. God has given us two ears, one mouth. We've heard that time and time again. But how many times is our problem that we need to hear. We need to hear what brother so-and-so is trying to tell us. We need to hear what scripture is trying to tell me, not my brother or sister. And I think to illustrate this, this is illustrated beautifully in, in the life of David. Did somebody say that some people have heroes in their life? Yeah, David, he's, he's a good go-to. Um, in, in 2 Samuel 23, we're not going to turn there. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 14 to 16, David was uh, hunkered down in a bunker. He was in a stronghold. He's in a safe place, is a cave. 
And there was the uh, war with the Philist Philistines. And the Philistines had surrounded David's hometown. And David's there hunkered down and his three of his military men are there. And it says there that David longed, and so he, he had this like longing in his heart, and he said, and I, I don't know how he said it, but I don't, I don't think he blasted this like super loud. But that is me reading into it. And here's what he said. Oh, that one would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And there's three men there, there's three military men, and they heard that. And they left, they risked their life to go get him a drink of water from that well. And as we think about being swift to hear, that's a picture of some men that were swift to hear. That was, David was their commander. And David had a desire. And he didn't have to say it twice. Like, he didn't even, in this case, expect them to get the water. He actually took the water and poured it out because I can't drink that. You, you risk your life for that. It, I, I cannot drink that. But being swift to hear. Are we swift to hear God's word? There is a quote by Alec Moyer who says, we might wonder why the ever-practical James does not proceed to outline schemes of daily Bible reading and the like. Why doesn't he tell us, you know, this is the formula, you need to get up at 6 o'clock every morning, get your coffee ready, 6.15 to 7.15, read this amount of scripture, spend this amount of time in prayer. All of that is good. But why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't James give some kind of direction on how we should read the Bible. For surely there are the, these are the ways we offer a willing ear to the voice of God. But he doesn't do that. Rather, he goes deeper. Frankly, frankly, there is little point of schemes and times if we do not have an attentive spirit. Listen to this carefully. It is possible to be regular in Bible reading, but to achieve no more than to have moved the book mark forward. The word is read, but not heard. My dear friends, if God's word is going to take root in our heart, we need to be swift to hear. Swift to hear what God's word has for us. Swift to hear God's word. Number two, how do we receive God's word? Let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak. Slow to speak. Goes right along with being swift to hear. It's pretty hard to be swift to hearing and, and uh, fast talking at the same time. What that looks like as soon as that person stops talking boom, you're talking, because I wasn't actually listening. I was listening to reply, not to understand. I'm speaking to myself up here this morning. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. When we are speaking... When I am speaking, I'm speaking to you this morning, and I am in a, in a giving relationship, okay? Like, I, I am not receiving from you. Well, that's not true. I am. I, I do see who's uh, awake and who's not, and, um, you know, there's, there's an atmosphere that goes on here, I, and I, it's my job to tune into that. What to do with it, I'm not sure. But anyways... Yes, I am in a, in a giving um, relationship. And whenever you are the speaker, you, you're not learning. You're not receiving. And if we are slow to speak, then we are quick to hear what the other person has to say. We are quick to hear what God has for us. Because 
if I'm always just talking, then maybe I'm not learning. Okay, does that make any sense? Um, Peter, there that night in the garden, and, and as he went and betrayed Jesus, Peter was slow to hear. He didn't hear the, cock, uh, the, the rooster crowing, and he was quick to speak. He was speaking he, things he shouldn't, and he was quick to wrath. How do we receive God's word this morning? Thirdly, slow to wrath. Slow to speak, slow to wrath, verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We know that there is godly anger. There is godly anger. There is anger that we need to have towards sin. That is Ephesians 4, verse 26. You can look that up. Another one, it's all over Scripture, or there's multiple references. Another one is uh, Psalms 97, 10. It says, If we love the Lord, we must hate sin. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. I believe I said that wrong. The quote from Psalms 97, 10 is, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Okay, and if there's something that you want to have a passion and, some, uh, and, a, and a boiling inside of you, which is wrath, it's, it's something that it's, it's in there and it wants to come out. If you want to have a wrath, you need to have a wrath towards sin. And, and you need to keep that healthy. That is what all of us need to have is a anger towards sin. But we're not talking about that type of an anger, that type of wrath. No, we're talking about a different kind of wrath, and James speaks to us about our, our tongue and our mouth quite often, and, and wrath is, is, is part of that in our speaking, and we'll get to that in James 3, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But man's anger does not produce righteousness. And I have a quote written down here that says, Speak when you are angry, and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. Is that true? Speak when you are angry, and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. James says, be slow to wrath. Be slow to boil inside. Galatians 4, verse 16, um, this is Paul speaking. He says, have I, come, have I become your enemy for telling the truth? You know, sometimes truth comes to us. Truth comes to us from God's word, and, and we're supposed to be slow to wrath. There's no need to get angry with the truth. And sometimes truth comes to us from other individuals. And that's another time to be slow to wrath. And if we, are, if we are quick to hear, we actually hear what the person is trying to tell us. There is so many people that go through their life, go through their marriages, and they feel never heard. And it's not because the other person doesn't have two ears. It's because he is not being attentive in spirit. And so when something is brought to us, we can say, you know, I do not like that person's approach. It felt confrontational. And I've got five reasons why he's got that thought. And it's really not true what he's saying. And I don't hear the truth. And I get angry. We're not supposed to do that. Real faith wants to hear truth. Wants to hear truth. Proverbs 16, verse... 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Hmm. Moving on. How do we receive God's word? Number two, we receive it in purity. Take this from verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, how do we receive God's word? We've got to lay aside the filth. God is not able to minister to us. We are not able to prosper if we have sin in our life. And we're supposed to take that sin, take that filthiness, and we're supposed to lay it aside. About, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I used to have a little pressure washing business and I would um, do some pressure washing for my brothers, their heavy, heavy equipment, and I would go out to the mines and clean up tractors and, and dozers. And, you know, there was nothing like spending a couple hours washing on like a D, D10. Um, 
I'd have a turbo tip on there and those things had a ton of mud on them. And you know, half the time that stuff was just coming straight back. And by the time I was done, I was a filthy man, okay? And I couldn't get in my truck without laying aside that filth and putting on some clean clothes. And that's the picture I get here, is that we are supposed to lay aside. We are supposed to part ways with the filthiness. 1 Corinthians 6, verse nine, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10. Um, I'm going to turn to that real quick. Ooh, the clock is moving. This is one of those, you could call it a landmine verse. It's, it's something you as a Christian should be very concerned about. 1 Corinthians 6 verse, verse 9, it's one of those ultimatum verses. It says, Know you not that the unrighteous, we're talking about laying aside filth. It says, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, and it gives a list of what the unrighteous are, which there's quite a few verse, uh, lists. This isn't the only one. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covets, uh, coveters, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. None of these shall inherit the kingdom of God. So we must lay that aside. Moving on, how do we receive God's word? We must receive it, the engrafted word, with meekness. If we do not receive God's word with meekness, then we are not able to grow. And I love the word picture here. I'm not sure if, if we today can appreciate the word engrafted like maybe they could in this text, I'm not sure, but just did a little bit of research and I know that there's probably folks in this room that know much more about this than I, so bear with my ignorance here. But when it talks about engrafting, particularly I, was just, I just looked up what it looks like to graft um, in plants. And when you do grafting, you take, particularly in trees, you take a root stock, which is just a tree with roots and it's, it's growing. And then you take a, a fruit-bearing tree branch, which has the fruit that you want produced. They call that a scion. And they, they cut both of them and they graft them together. A very um, particular process that they follow. And, and the two are grafted together. And then the tree takes on the fruit that was grafted on. It's, it's a beautiful picture. And so as we actually let God's word into our heart and it's planted, it's there, there's some permanence, then we produce the fruit of Jesus Christ and his spirit, the fruit of the spirit, as it is engrafted in. Receive the word with meekness. And why do we do this, my friends? We do this because it is able to save your souls. So what is our response? What is our response to receiving God's word with meekness? To being attentive to really hearing it, to what God has us to do. Verse 22, don't just be um, hearers of the word, but be doers. Be not doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And it gives a picture here of someone who looks in a mirror, and he sees something, something that needs attention, and he right away moves away, and either he forgot, or he doesn't care, but that's the picture that we have have here. And this morning, you know, knowing I was preaching a message that, you know, we talk about looking in the mirror and making sure you take care of what you see in the mirror, I sat down this morning in church after I had looked quite well in the mirror and Corinna looks over at me and says, you, you missed something there on your cheek when you were shaving. I'm like, great, I thought I was looking like pretty close. I guess I was deceived. 
I'd like to read you some verses. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. This is to Christians. This is per people that prophesied in his name. Not all of them shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then I will profess unto him, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Luke 6 says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. And he is like a person who digs a deep hole and builds a solid foundation. Romans 2 verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. 1 John 2 verse 17, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. The person that takes God's word and really hears what God wants for them and does it, that man is blessed in his deeds. My dear friends, we're called in verse 25 to look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. Okay? The perfect law of liberty, is that what you think about when you think about God and his plan for your life and all of the things that he is asking of you? Do you see that as the perfect law of liberty? This is a freedom in Christ. Liberty in Christ. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. God has not set up a bunch of things here in Scripture so that your life can be the worst life ever. It's not His intent to make your life miserable. He is doing this for your good. And when you look into the law of liberty, you need to do it and not be forgetful. So, what is our response? Three things. If any, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and brideth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Wow. We'll be talking about the tongue here in a couple chapters. But what it is saying here is that if, if a person seems to be religious, you and I seem to be religious this morning. We have outward appearance that we are religious. Okay? And bridleth not his tongue doesn't have his tongue in control. He's deceived. And this man's religion is vain. And vain means empty, it's false. And, and so, we, we, we appear to be the epitome of followers of Jesus Christ. But someone comes in and, and gets to know me and all of my life seems to be quite well, but I just have this explosive, uncontrolled tongue. My religion is vain, and it is not helping that individual in their walk with Christ. So, what do we do when we've actually received God's word, and when, when our faith is genuine, we have a bridled tongue? Second of all, our relationships. Verse 27, pure religion and, un and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions. How do you think and think about and how do you treat the weakest that are among you? Here in um, biblical context, the widows and the fatherless would be a very vulnerable set of people. For various reasons, financially would be one of them. And... And it is, it is Jesus who is your father and has a heart for you when you were a lost child. And we are supposed to have that same heart for, for others. And, and you see that here in, in, in our relationships. So what is your heart towards the vulnerable and the weak? If we have accepted with meekness the engrafted word and it is bringing forth fruit, we are going to care for those with the heart of Jesus. Lastly, what do we do? We keep ourselves unspotted from the world. 
Keep yourself unspotted from the world. What is the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And I'm telling you, we have to have two ears and we've got to hear so that we are not deceived, so that we actually know if we are unspotted from the world. So that we really can decipher where my heart is. Am I unspotted from the world or am I not? So in conclusion, we do not want to be, be the 75-year-old man who sobs uncontrollably. Not that we won't when we look in the mirror at 75, but spiritually, but spiritually. And, and I believe it's much, it's much deeper than, you know, well, the spiritual implications are that one day we'll stand before God. And it is the one who proclaims that Jesus is Lord and Savior. It is the one that proclaims to have faith. And it's the one that actually does the things that the Father asks him to do. And so, my dear friend, don't just be hearers, but be doers also. Let us kneel for prayer. Dear God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus, who is still interceding on our behalf. I thank you, Lord, that we're able to come boldly to the throne of grace. And I thank you, Lord, that you've loved us when we were yet unlovely. Father, we know that to really serve you, we must do it out of a heart of love. Why do we do these things? It's because of your love and it's your love that compels us to live a life that's consecrated to you. Father, I just pray that each one would have a desire to allow your word in so that your word could do its work and, to, and that your word could produce the fruit. I pray for the young ones among us, the children. I pray that they could take a hold of some nugget this morning bless their moms and dads as they try to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I pray for grandmas and grandpas this morning. Thank you, Lord, for those who have, in a sense, gone before and are ones that can encourage us when the path seems dim. Just help us, Lord, to, to press on in the most holy faith. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.